You may be seated. Genesis chapter 50, verse 1. This morning, we come towards the end of the story of Jacob and his family, and specifically, we've been talking about Joseph and how God has worked through his life and the different things that have happened. But this morning, we're going to look at really a basic principle in the Bible and something that often happened in the Bible when someone died. And I titled the message, Life is Not a Laugh Track. And I think of our society and the way we're geared and the way we uh, things are emphasized and we have these TV shows and they, they put the laugh track on there because they want you to laugh at the specific times that they want you to laugh. They, they put the laugh track on and sometimes they put the laugh track on and you're saying, why am I laughing? That's, that's not even funny. And if you think about that, that's kind of how our culture deals with life, with situations, with hardships, with death, with sickness. You just need to laugh and go on. And you talk to people, they're always talking about, you know, how was your weekend? And like you had to do something. You're under pressure that you had to do something extraordinary, right? If you didn't have, you know, if you didn't have the right picture to put on Facebook, right, that your weekend was so awesome, you don't put anything, right? And so there's this, this, this underlying pressure that when things happen, we don't have time today to process things. We don't take time to meditate. We don't take time to evaluate. We don't take time to, to just let things happen. And, and sometimes Christians can be insensitive. Sometimes something bad can happen to somebody. And what is the classic response? A Christian will come. Somebody just, the car just had an accident or somebody got sick or maybe somebody died. And they'll come up to you and say, well, brother, all things work together for good. Maybe true. But God will reveal that to them. You don't have to. And I'm sure they know the verse. I'm sure you didn't have to remind them of the verse. And sometimes we, we expect people just have a smile and go on. You don't have time to mourn. You don't have time to be sad. You don't have time to, to be depressed. Right? You go to the doctor, and I've heard this many times. The doctor will ask you, are you depressed? Because if you are, we got some good drugs for you. They'll make you happy. Don't worry about the symptoms. We'll just, we want you to be happy. And so we have this society all the time. You got to be happy. You got to be smiling. Everything's got to be great. You can't, you just got to smile even if you're hurting. But the reality is, you can't smile all the time. Sometimes bad things happen. Sometimes we get sad. Sometimes somebody close to us leaves. Sometimes that job we were waiting for, we don't get. And, and there's times of disappointment. There's times of things that are unpleasant, that are hard in life. And you can't just smile and get over it. Sometimes there's a time where we have to take that time to process that stuff situation, to evaluate that situation, to even mourn that person of that situation so we can emotionally deal with it. And as we come to Joseph and Jacob here, Genesis chapter 50, in the preceding verse in chapter 49, Jacob died. And notice Jacob, Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And so we have this whole passage here about the mourning of Jacob's death. And, you know, as we think about this, we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but even... Even in death, 
we want to brush that by in our society, don't we? You go to a nice air-conditioned uh, funeral home, and everything's prepared, and you have certain times, and you go to the funeral. I think years ago, things were different. I remember my first funeral, if you want to call it, in Romania. John, somebody he knew, died, and... There were these buildings. This is kind of what some of them looked like. But after communism, a lot of the factories and a lot of the buildings got destroyed. And they were just left there. And there was this young gypsy family. The husband was young. I'm not sure. I think it was a work accident. And I went to one of the rooms. It's just a room. And a lot of these buildings where people lived, there was no electricity. There was no running water. Sometimes they had a wire that they would hang from the neighbor to have electricity. They would go in the courtyard to the well to get water. And for many years, while we were in Romania, uh, they didn't have funeral homes. And they would have a casket in the house. And I can remember going to this funeral, this young gypsy man, his wife, a few kids, a few relatives, having that casket right there in the room and reading some Bible verses and praying for the family. I can remember times in the summer, they would stay up all night with the with the, ba- with the body, sometimes you'd go into those rooms and the smell was something I can remember to this day. Death is, smells bad. We don't feel it today. We don't see it today. And we go to the cemetery and that every time this would happen, it would just kind of show the finality of death. Because everything, there were just these wooden boxes. And I can remember many times the guys, the grave diggers there, while I'm speaking, they're putting the cover, they're taking these big spikes and they're nailing them in. You hear the nails pounding. And then you see them take the ropes and they're putting the ropes and they're putting that person in the grave as a finality, that death is final, that death is real, that death is awful. That death is not something that we need to take lightly and joke about. There's no laughing track when it comes to death. And if you notice Genesis 50, verse 1, Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for him, for such are the days required for those who are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him. Notice what it said, 70 days. That's over two months. Two months they mourned the death of Jacob. Now verse 4, now when the days of the morning were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If now I found favor in your eyes, please speak in the hearing of, hearing of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, Behold, I am dying in my grave, which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. There you shall bury me. Now, therefore, please let me go up and bury my father, and I will come back. And Pharaoh said, Go up, and bury your father as he made you swear. So Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as the house of Joseph, his brothers and his fathers, only their little ones, their flocks and their herds that they left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horses, men, and it was a very great gathering. And then notice verse 10. They came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond Jordan. And there, notice what it said, there they mourned 
there with a very, with a great and very solemn limitation. He observed seven days of mourning for his father. So they went up and Joseph, now think about it. Joseph was a spiritual man, right? Joseph was a type of Christ. Joseph was a man that in the prison, God was with him. God blessed him. He was a man that was very spiritually minded, a very godly man, a, very, a, a man of faith, a man of character. And you don't see him just saying, all right, I'll see Jacob in heaven and that's it. You see there's this time, there's this period that he talks about, this period of mourning, this t- period of grief, this period of reconciling and dealing and meditating and, and getting over this terrible death of his father. Because he knew his father was going to die eventually. But we have this time of grief, this time of mourning, this time, if you will, to process everything that had, hap- that had happened. And it wasn't just looked over lightly. And the point I'm trying to make this morning is that I think part of our emotional problems today in our society is we don't take time to process things. We don't take time to grieve. We don't take time for sorrow. We don't take time to cry out to God. There is this almost this uh, merit badge we get for how much we can hold in and how little emotion we can show. And oftentimes, this isn't the only passage in the Scripture that we find this period of mourning. We find this great sorrow that is poured out for this person. There's many instances in the Bible we see this. And so it leads me to think that there are times when we need to evaluate and think about our lives. Now, Solomon said something very interesting. This is a verse that... If you don't know, you should think about this verse often. But it says this in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 2. It says, It's better to go to the house of the morning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men. For the living will take it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter. For by a sad countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of what? The morning but the house of fools is in the house, the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Uh, I'm just going to read it for you in the NLT. It's more of a paraphrase, but it says this. It is better to attend a funeral than to attend a banquet. For everyone dies eventually. And the living will what? Take it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter because the heart is made better through trouble for the wise person what thinks carefully when in mourning but fools focus their thoughts on pleasure does that not describe the society does that not describe today that our mind is totally focused on pleasure now i'm not saying we go to the other extreme and I'm not saying we need to be sad people. We have joy in God. And the Christian has motives to be happy and to rejoice. That's not what I'm talking about. But what I'm talking about today is there are times in our lives where we need to take life seriously. I think living for so long around poverty and suffering and hardship It gives me maybe more sober view on life. I think sometimes when we grow up around prosperity and easiness, we lose focus on the reality of life. And notice Solomon says here, the wise person, when he goes, this is what Solomon is saying, when you go to the house of the morning, you evaluate, you're like, wait a minute. Life is serious. You don't know what's tomorrow. You don't 
you make plans, but James says you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Our life's but a, like a vapor. And he says you think carefully. In other words, you, you think that you'll, maybe you'll make better decisions when you think about the implications of the decisions you're making today. And what's that, what, is, what that is going to mean in the future. And so it's serious. But fools focus their thoughts on pleasure. What does that mean? They're, they're not thinking seriously. And when something bad happens, it overtakes them. And so life is not a laugh track. Life is serious. And so three applications from this passage this morning. And the first one is this. There is a time to pour our sorrows out before God. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, did he say to the disciples, let's have a party? Let's rejoice in the Lord? No, he prayed very sorrowful there. Very, very reflective, knowing he was going to the cross. And the Bible says he prayed with great uh, drops of sweat, drops of blood. He prayed earnestly, sorrowfully there. It was a solemn time. And Joseph comes here. He's, he's crying out to God. David, many times in the Bible, cried out to God. The Bible says this, people in every situation put your trust in God. Notice what it says, pour out your heart before him, for God is a refuge for us. So that means there is no merit in keeping everything in. I can remember when my father died. I was in Romania when my father died. And I was not able to be there for the funeral. My sister was there. And I can remember years later, I don't even remember how long later, when I was back and actually had time to sit down and talk to my sister and process everything and cry over it. And even as I was thinking about this message, and started thinking back to the stories of Romania and the different experiences. And there's a lot of things you put out of your mind. There's a lot of things you forget or you purposely forget. But there is a time where we just need to give it to God. And oftentimes I've seen in my own spiritual, personal walk, when I am troubled when I am distressed, when I am sorrowful, when I am even angry, if I will take the time just to get alone with God and pour out my heart. Say, God, I don't understand this. Or, God, why did this happen? Or, God, give me strength for this. And just pour out honestly and earnestly. We do that also with each other, don't we? See, sometimes, sometimes, it's good just to listen to people. Sometimes people just want somebody to listen to them. And so here we see David, he's, he, we see this, this funeral, and in David's life he's saying, people, just pour your hearts out to God. He listens, he hears, we have mercy at the throne of grace. You can pour your heart to God, out to God any time. He's there, he's listening, and he understands. And then the second point I want to make is sometimes we need to mourn with others, not just tell them to get over it. What do you do when an 8-year-old child dies? What do you do when an 18-year-old Bible college student dies? What do you tell a person like that? There's not a lot you can say. And there's not, 
doesn't matter how much theological training you have at that time. There's not a lot you can say. Sometimes it's good just to be there and to not to say anything. Especially if you're going to say something stupid. Sometimes it's the time just to, the Bible says, mourn with those that mourn and rejoice with those that rejoice. And so there is a time of empathy, a time of comfort, a time to encourage, a time to be with somebody, a time to be there listening for somebody. Because sometimes people just need you there. God will show them. They'll figure it out. They'll get over it eventually. But you're not the one that had a person dear to you die. You're not the one that's going through the sickness. You're not the one that's going through whatever they're going through. You're there. You don't know. God knows. I don't know. It's hard to tell somebody advice when you don't know. But it's easy to be there with them and mourn with them and help them through that and have empathy with them and be there as encouragement. Sometimes that may, means more than anything you can say. Be there. Help them. Don't say uns- insensitive things that could aggravate the situation. And then the third point we learn from this is death is coming and we don't know when. I think that's why it's good to go to the house of mourning because sometimes we live our lives like there's no tomorrow. Sometimes we live our lives like there's no day of reckoning. Sometimes we live our lives as though we're just going to, everything, tomorrow everything's going to be the same. Things can change drastically. I was reminded of being sensitive when I was coaching soccer. We, we, uh, one thing we do is we like to get a team name, and our shirts were red. And so somebody, it was probably JoJo, said, let's name our team the Fire Starters. And one of the assistant coaches, Ed, is a fireman. And after I said that, I looked at Ed and I said, maybe we shouldn't call ourselves the Fire Starters. And Ed said, no, I can't go with that name. Why? Because he's been there. He's been there at the fire. He's been there when the cigarette cost the house to go on fire. Somebody died. Sometimes we can be careless. On one of our furloughs, we would often listen to, in the car when we travel as a family, hours on end, we would listen to various books. And one of the books we listened to was 3,000 Degrees. It's the story of the six firefighters that died in the Worcester Worcester Cold Storage fire many years ago, about 15 years ago now. Uh, Years ago, before they had refrigerators, they used to call, my dad used to call it an icebox. How many of you remember an icebox? Right. I was like, I could never figure out why my dad said an icebox. Like it's a refrigerator. Well, years ago, they would cut the ice from the rivers. And they would put them in cold storage. And they'd bring the ice to your house. And you'd have a, a like a refrigerator, but it didn't have electricity. You'd put the ice in there and keep things cold. Well, they made these warehouses called cold storage because they, they had no windows. And they were insulated. And one of the firefighters that died, it said in the book, as he rode by that cold storage, he actually said, he made this statement, he says, I hope I'm never on duty when that place burns. 
And one day there were two homeless people that were living in the cold storage. And they got in a fight. They knocked over a candle. And the place started on fire. They got the call, went out. And the firefighters came and one of the policemen informed me that there may be two homeless people in the building. They had left. And so they entered the building. It was clear. You know, this is thousands of square feet in a warehouse. No windows. One entrance and exit. They went in. Within five minutes, the place was black. They were all on the floor. And you can hear... The book recorded the transmissions of each one of them as they were running out of oxygen. The fire chief had to stand at the door after six had already gone in and said, no more. And six firefighters died that day. And so death is not a joke. It's no laugh track. You don't know when it's going to come. It could could come suddenly. And just like the homeless who were careless, even the firefighters were careless because this impacted the fire departments all around the country. Because they went in, they didn't have ropes, they didn't have anything, they just went in, they were even careless. They didn't have any plans for the building before they went in. Changed really the procedures for fire departments all over the country because of this fire. But they paid the ultimate price. And I can remember in the book describing when the fire chief would go to the homes of these people. And of course, as you're reading the book, you, you learn the lives of all these characters and the fire chief going to the house. And of course, when the wife saw the fire chief, she knew. She knew. She knew the fire was going on. She knew her husband was there. And so, death is coming. We don't know how long, how short. And then finally, eternity is too long to laugh our short life away. You hear people, well, I don't want to discuss religion. Really? You don't want to discuss religion? Why? I mean, wouldn't it be important? Don't you think if there is a God and there is eternity and there is heaven, there is hell, don't you think you ought to like investigate a little bit? I'm amazed how many people say, well, I don't believe in God. Have you ever read the Bible? No. Do you know what a Bible is? No. Have you ever seen a Bible? But yet today we'll do all of we'll investigate all these things and we'll we'll look for everything. God said, try me, prove me, see if I'm right or not. That is the stupidest thing to say. I won't discuss religion. You better think about discussing religion. You better think about what eternity is. You better think if there's something more that God created us to live in eternity. With him. Turn is too short. Life is serious. We need to take a time of reflection. And that's really what this passage is this time of mourning, this time with Jacob. We think about his life and what Jacob meant to Israel and the future. And how they mourned him all those days had that great lamentation there. Now Solomon penned these words, it's better to go to the house of mourning. And so this morning I think it's time for us maybe just to evaluate a couple things in our lives. Are we just going along with the laugh track? Are we taking life serious? How about those that are around you? Do you appreciate them? You appreciate your wife. You appreciate your kids. You appreciate your friends. Do we treat them with indifference or carelessness? Do we take time in this society of running, 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 running? Do we take 
time to wind down? Do we cut off the internet? This drives my kids crazy. I will cut off the internet. I'll stop the internet. You know why I'll do that? I want to see my kids. And sometimes you'll get them all together at the table and you'll be, you know, they'll come down, ah, Daddy, why did you turn the internet off? Because I'm afraid one day I'll go up to your room and you won't be there. The internet will have sucked you in. You'll be gone. But just that time as a family sitting around talking and get to know each other. Do we even know each other in our families? Talking, discussing. For your for husbands this morning, time of reflection, and it's it's not that your wife is going into mourning, but do you take time to let your wife express herself? Do you allow her to express herself without killing her? Okay, because I have learned that. When my wife expresses herself, it's not a personal attack. But seriously, do we take time to talk as husband and wife? Do we take time to disconnect and get away? Just go for a walk. Go for an ice cream. Go for a drive. Do something together. Get away. We are so pressured in this society. We're going, going, going. It's on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And hey, what'd you do this weekend? Wait a, you know what? You know what I did this weekend? I sat home and did nothing. And I feel good. I actually learned something about my wife. New. So, I think also we can use this time of reflection to evaluate our failures. We don't like to talk about that today, right? We like to encourage everybody, and, and I'm all for encouragement, but there's a time to say, you know what? You blew it. You failed. You learn through failure, right? You learn more through failure. So sometimes we need to evaluate, look, I failed on this, or I haven't been as consistent with this, or I need to get better with this, or I need to work on this, or I need to develop more character, or I need to spend more time with God. We need to take this time for evaluating, and then we need to take this time of morning to think, am I holding on to something that is destroying me? I'm amazed how people hold on to bitterness to their destruction. Something happened to them. Somebody said something to them. Somebody didn't come to them. And they get upset. And they hold on to it. They hold on to it. They hold on to it. And it eats them and destroys them. If you haven't read that book, un- Offendable, you have to read it. Because I want to live a life that I'm not offended. I'm not going to let other people destroy my happiness. If you want to be offended, you'll be offended. You can find something, probably this morning. Two or three things to be offended about, if you're looking for it. Sometimes you just got to let go. Let go. Person owes you money, let go. If I would have held on to that in Romania, I probably would not be alive today. Just let it go. Person that did that, let it go. Give it to God. A time of reflection. Pour out your heart before Him. Maybe you're holding something in. Maybe something's bothering you. Maybe you're looking for answers. Have you taken time to pour out your heart to God and just say, God, I'm giving this to you. God, I, I need help. I'm nervous about this situation and, 
and I don't understand it, and, and give me the answer. Time of reflection. It's better, and it's probably well advised. Occasionally, maybe more often, to go to the house of mourning and gain some wisdom. Let's stand together. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Nobody looking around this morning. Question I have for you this morning. We talked about death. We'll all die. And we'll all go to either heaven or hell. I was with a friend of mine, I was talking to somebody today, and he asked somebody, if you die today, do you know you go to heaven? And his friends will respond, well, I hope so, I've been a good person. You know what? It's not about being a good person. It's about what Jesus did on the cross. He died on the cross. He bore our sins. He bore our penalty. The Bible says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Salvation depends on knowing Jesus, not what you do. And then as we think about eternity, anything that's bothering you, let it go. Anything that's troubling you, pour out your heart to Him. Or maybe you just need to reflect, you know what? There's some things in my life I need to change. I need to appreciate those that are near me. I need to invest more time in meaningful things and less time in meaningless things. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this time this morning. We thank you for your word, how it speaks to us. Lord, this time of 70 days and 10 days lamentation and this whole entourage that went, Lord, to mourn the death of Jacob. And sometimes we look in the Scripture and say, well, why did people do this, Lord? Lord, we see in our own society we're, we're hurried, We're expected just to smile and follow the laugh track and and not take time to reflect, not take time to mourn, not take time to be sad. Lord, we know you're our healer. You're our counselor. You're the one that is our medicine. We give it all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. If God spoke into your heart this morning, you come as we sing. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. So teach my song to rise to you When temptation comes my way And when I cannot stand I fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay Lord, I need you Oh, I need you Every hour I need you My one defense My righteousness Oh God, how I need you You're my one.